Right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today. I'd like to call the September 16th, 2021 work session to order. We have a few items on the agenda today. The first item, Dr. Matt Lutz will bring us up to date on our school's capacities. All right. Well, um, when the final count comes in, we'll probably, we will have more students enrolled in Currituck County Schools than we have ever had. Uh, if we were to, today it looks like around 4,400 students. Um, Central Elementary uh, is that, and so the, the, the enrollment that I speak of is K-12. It does not include preschool, um, but preschool does have an impact on our capacity numbers. Uh, along with EC in terms of how many students we can actually fit in the building. Um, Central currently has one classroom available for use in that building. Uh, Currituck Middle has two. Jarvisburg has no traditional classrooms available at this point in time. Uh, there is other space that we can reconfigure. Uh, much the same way that Shaw Road did, those, those two are sister schools in terms of layout. Um, I'm going to pop down to Shaw Road. Shaw Road has one current classroom available, but keep in mind that the one room that they have available is due to the fact that uh, Ms. Nelson and her team actually redid, along with Matt Mullins, the book room to create that as a classroom. They've also taken over a teacher workroom and dismantled a computer lab, and we've added uh, two modular units. So there's one space that's on hold for the kindergarten class in case our numbers go over. Um, so we have maxed out our space at Sharboro, and it takes us to Mayock Elementary, where Ms. Kelly and her team have done an uh, outstanding job of utilizing every square inch of that building. Um, we have students that uh, we in the lobby, gym, on the stage, uh, all of the closets have been beautifully reconfigured. <laughs> and they have. I mean, yes, you they wouldn't have. know they were closets. And, and I have to say, I was there last week and toured the whole school, and the staff, oh my gosh, they were so upbeat. That, you know, they were not complaining. I mean, they were spot on. I did ask her if she had somebody in the bathroom teaching. <laughs> <laughs> they are as full as they could possibly be. Wow. Um, uh, again, with the reconstruct, with the addition and the demolition of the kindergarten building, which will occur in the very near future, she made the decision to bring the kids, or Ms. Reynolds, quick to bring them in to start the year, rather than have that transition. Uh, definitely a, uh, a, a huge task, and, and again, the, the positive attitude of staff is greatly appreciated. Uh, Mayock Middle School, uh, there are 600 students as of today. And again, that project as well is pending, uh, getting the addition onto Mayock Middle School as the class that is set to arrive next year, the sixth grade class, uh, somewhere between 2.30 and 2.40 for next year. How many did you say, I'm sorry? How many rooms available at any? Uh, there's nothing okay. available at okay. Mayock Middle. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, the elementaries are easier to um, identify as rooms available, uh, whereas the secondary schools uh, for middle school, it's about where do the kids go when they don't have the core classes, and do we have enough spaces for the students to go for their extra for their uh, extracurricular classes? As long as we have enough space, which is why we need to reconfigure um, some of the space within that building. To like, uh, for example, a band room needs to be considerably larger for a building that's going to house 700 plus students um, in the very near future. Uh, and high schools. Of course, that's a separate discussion altogether because they have open periods throughout the day that can be utilized in terms of space. Um, so our high school right now is not facing an overcrowded issue. But we are, with the number of students that are arriving in Bayonne Middle School, the addition is sort of needed. So that is where where we are at. We are we are tight on our space. Um, we continue to have. Uh, I, I spoke with um, the interim county manager, uh, I pray this morning. Um, we are going to continue to have our meetings, and we'll, we look forward to another joint board meeting uh, late October, early November. So we can keep our momentum going as we cannot afford a hiccup yeah. in the midst of the growth. We've got to make sure we have a plan uh, for the near future. 
what we have a plan, we have to make sure we continue moving forward <laughs> with it. What did you say about the high schools? The high school right now is sitting at 1,069 students, but we do not currently have space issues within the high school. And NAP? NAP is at 250. They have a few classrooms. Excuse me? They have a few classrooms available. Uh, NAP, uh, again, high school scheduling looks different than, than elementary or middle school. So there is much, you're able to take class teachers and move teachers around as kids move around. So they, you have a more exponential space usage at the high school level. That's at the four level. Four at four. each grade, and then you go to the middle school, it comes down to how many students can, how many extracurricular classrooms. When they, for example, you can use a divisor of, let's say we did 30 students, and we had 10 classrooms, that'd be 30 per, and we had 300 students, 30 students, we need 10 classrooms for 30. So the middle schools look different. The high school itself, though there's, there's continues to be space, uh, although there's always work that can be done in the high school. And you mentioned about the computer lab at Shawboro being dismantled. Do they no longer have computer lab there? They still have computers, they just don't have, we have uh, moved away from, some of our buildings are moving away from the traditional uh, computer labs because now we're one-to-one -one across the district. Uh, thanks to Sandy and her team, one of the positive outcomes there. So, so our kindergarten, K-1-2, uh, all have computers they didn't before. They so we can go to them rather than, we can reutilize that space. And that used to be a part of the specials Still at Shawboro, and the teacher goes a to part there. of the planning. Mm -hmm. So the teachers are still doing <coughs> five days of planning. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Each building is doing that a little bit differently. So it's not that they're not using the computers, just so we're clear. They all have Chromebooks. Correct. Right. They just don't have separate so instruction. Do I hear you on say they have separate instruction. They just don't so have it in a computer lab. Oh, okay. so that's what you know, there's nothing has changed with their specials except that there are not desktops all the way around the room. They bring their device with them. They still have their, their class. I they see. still get their instruction, but they use their device. Yeah, they don't have their own. Okay. And it's probably less disruptive because they just have it with them and then they just open up. Because I used to have them go to the computer. Right. And I saw them doing that today. They <coughs> were just some were with the teacher and the other ones were at their desk and they all had their Chromebooks. So, yeah, like you said, maybe one of the only good things. And what was the number at not Oh. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> don't forget. Don't leave that. 101. Oh, oh my god. That's breaking records. I say, yeah, I thought I'd <laughs> talk to him the other day and say that over 100. In a full kindergarten class of 21. Sorry, don't let not sign it out. They usually help us with our numbers, but right now they're the first. Everyone found out the secret. That's right. So, and I do want to touch back on the computer lab. So, for example, Central also dismantled their traditional computer lab. Um, it's proven upon us to utilize our space. So that it's not, hey, we're out of space. We're utilizing every square inch so that we can so that we can stretch our, our square footage as far as we can. So it's not done just to say we don't need it anymore. I don't necessarily, if we weren't one-to-one, -one, we'd have probably have bought a moving cart and had to move things around. We would have, it would have been much more difficult. What will we do with all these computers? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> not to open a can of worms, we've had some issues with the latest security updates on some software. So we have um, older desktops that are dying all over the place. So we have taken the, the newer models that we could out of Moyak Elementary, out of Shawboro, and out of Central where we broke down those labs. And we have used all the three trying to get <coughs> other places going while we're waiting for our order to come in. So they're all being used. Any other questions? And we didn't mention Griggs, but they're okay with space. We know that. Griggs continues to be the only building with space available. They're operating well below capacity. Um, so we know that, that unfortunately, our growth doesn't coincide with the space. Our growth is in the north. Um, and so they're, therefore, it, you know, we, it, it, the word redistricting has come up, and I think we've what we want to do is continue to move forward with our plan and hold off as long as we can in terms of redistricting so that when that does occur, we either have an expansion of our elementary, we have a new new school, and we can do this all as one. That's yeah. a very painful process. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you, Dr. Boots. Safe Schools Update. Uh, Ms. Virginia Arrington, Student Services Coordinator, and Dr. Matt Lewis. Good afternoon. Um, we're going to start off today by sharing some numbers with you from the first day of school until the present time as far as the number of positives and the number of quarantines that we've had. Um, you will notice that the first week of school we had 11 positives and 140 quarantines. That, the first week of school we did not have masks. So at the end of that week, the board met and approved that we would then go to masks required in the school buildings. Um, so that leads us to the week of August 30th where we have 64 positives and 188 quarantines. Um, we expected that number to still be high the second week because you have to go back 48 hours with the onset of symptoms. And so by doing the mask mandate at the end of the week, we knew that there would be some carryover into the second week. So by the time we get to September 6th to September 10th that week, we have been in school with masks for a week. Um, and so then you see the number of positives and the number of quarantines significantly went down to 29. Um, last Friday, we even had zero quarantines. Um, so this week, as, as of today, the end of business today, we had 29 positives and 10 quarantines. Um, the positives are going to be what they are because families are doing things, people are out in the community and things like that. These are not, we are not having any <coughs> clusters in the school. So we're not finding that we have positives or quarantines in the schools that are clustered coming from the same classroom or grade level. I ask every one of the reports, anytime I see multiple cases in the school, I always ask, probably, I probably ask you that, right, Virginia, multiple times a week, are we, at, are we seeing any student to student spread in the classroom? And the answer continues to be no. Um, there's been a couple cases where we thought, oh, this looks, but then when we back followed everything, it was definitely an out of school uh, we could we could track it through and the elementary schools continue we have not seen they, they continue to kind of lag behind the numbers of the, the second level in okay, virginia the number of quarantines were those 10 day quarantines so some of them are um but the quarantine ending date is kind of a moving target because it depends on if they're in the house or out of the house um you know a friend or grandma's house or whatever um, so if they're in if they're in the house and they cannot quarantine from the positive then that quarantine could be up to 24 days um, typically a quarantine is 10 days um, to start but if they're asymptomatic they can test on the fifth day and if they're negative they can come back on the eighth day if they choose not to test and they're asymptomatic they stay out the 10 days and come back. If they test sometime in that 10 day quarantine and they're positive, then they have an additional 10 days from the positive test, but they have to. So it's it, it's somewhat of a moving target and it is difficult to kind of track exactly when students come back in. Um, but we're trying our best to make sure that students are marked either excused absence or the remote learning if they're well enough to do their work and they're having so the first week kids missed 140 missed 1400 days of school and the second 1880 days at least it's a lot so you know I mean, um, yeah. that's the boss. coming down that's great yeah. yeah absolutely any other questions do we have um kind of a system in place when they when the kids do miss school I know at the beginning of school we kind of had some hiccups along the way do we have a protocol now that we follow for those students that this is what happens and then this happens can you shed a little bit of light on that yes so when students are out um, and that whether the nurse is saying they need to be out or whether our parent is contacting the nurse to say you know my child was at grandma's house this week and they um, are close contact or someone the nurse is sending quarantine or COVID-related absences out to the teachers. 
and that cues the teacher to know that they're going to be out multiple days and the teacher then is in contact with the student and with their family depending on the age of the student um, so that they can access their work through Google Classroom. Good. The teacher is in contact with the student or it's the student's responsibility? The teacher should be in contact with the student or their family depending on if it's an elementary student or a high school student. And at this point we still don't have anything in place for students like at the high school level to zoom in for a math class? No, we do not. Okay. I know teachers, um, some teachers have are offering office hours, so they are still trying to make contact with students to be able to um, answer specific questions or help them with specific needs. Well, and I think that's a better situation anyway because I know I talked to numerous teachers last year who didn't I mean, the kid might be logged on, but they never saw their face, they never responded, they never did anything. So at least this way, there's face, I mean, not face to face, but there's actual one -on -one. conversation, one-on-one -on -one conversation, yes. A family concern I have is lots of makeup work, you know, you can read it, do the assignment, but with new material like math, math is the one that really concerns me because they're constantly, doing new objectives and you know you can't just make it up if you haven't been taught how to do it but hopefully our quarantines are going down so I'm you know and if teachers are reaching out to students and offering office hours then that sounds good we, we like I mean you know Sandy and I we've talked extensively about you know, we love to move to where we record a single lesson especially in math so that yeah. students can go back any student to catch those that highlighted direct instruction. It would be wonderful if we moved into that. And we, our teachers learned so much last year uh, with technology and, and how to do that that I, I would welcome that um, as we move forward. Um, but again, we're kind of getting our sea legs back after 18 months of, of uh, COVID. And I, and I don't mean to imply that math is more important than anything else. I mean, certainly, even in shop class, learning to change the oil, I mean, you know, it would be valuable to have that on the video as well, or in construction class, or anyway. But math by far is the most difficult. I, for me, it would be. <laughs> it, it is, yeah. And our data is close to that when we take a look at that later on. So. And the parents, and the, are, they're talking with the nurses, and the nurses are kind of giving them guidance on how long they should have to be out in quarantine. and. And are they trying to all follow kind of the same standard? Because I mean, some families have multiple kids at multiple schools. Yes. And so I know I've talked to some parents who, you know, when they were told one thing at this school and then told something else. And I know it's all kind of being worked out, but and now that we're kind of getting into the fourth week, is it trying to be more? And are we giving them written? Because I'm going to tell you right now, you've told me all this, but if I was a parent getting a call and it was just, telling me all that I'd be like I need something written right down so are we sending something written down we are not sending something written down because a lot of times a student has been out and the parents calling and saying okay you know my student's been out for three days but we and I've done many phone calls myself okay. so um, if I'm helping a school or if there are siblings at other schools we try to get together and say all right here's the date so we don't say ten days but five days but eight days but we say, let, if you choose not to get your student yeah, tested, yeah. yes, then you, they can come back on this date and we actually give them the date. Okay. Um, and I've made sure, do you, can you, are you at a place you can write this down? Do you want me to email you the yeah. information? Okay. You know, that kind of thing. Because it's a lot. Are we going to touch on the testing later? Yes. Or, okay. Okay, fine. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so we, starting on Monday, September 13th, we began our diagnostic testing program. And diagnostic testing refers to testing when an individual is symptomatic or when the individual has been determined to be in a close contact with a COVID positive case. Um, the, um, the company that we deal with is MAKO, and when parents log on to sign up to have the COVID testing, it's called color um, and when they sign up 
and they're checking the boxes. Um, color provides a HIPAA statement. And their HIPAA statement, they provide one HIP, HIPAA statement for their range of services. So their HIPAA statement does refer to testing, vaccinations, and other services that they provide. Um, and so that, that, when a parent clicks on that, they are agreeing to that. However, we, Crowtech County Schools, are only doing diagnostic testing. Um, we are not doing vaccinations. We're not doing weekly screenings of everyone. We're only doing the diagnostic testing, and that is only when parents opt in. Um, in addition to them opting in by signing up, we um, are getting a second layer of permission. So the nurse isn't, if a student comes to the nurse and they look them up and they see that they've been opted in for testing, the, the nurse is calling the parent. And if it's an elementary school parent, K-5, when the nurse talks to the parent, they're saying, your child is symptomatic, um, we need you to come get them, we know that you've opted in for the testing. Um, if you want us to do the test, we will wait until you get here. Because a, a parent does not want their six-year-old being swabbed without them present. Uh, you know. um, if it's a 612 student, um, same script. However, we are saying to the parent, we can swab them while you're on your way, or we can wait till you get here. So we are getting, not only have they opted in to the color website, we are getting an additional layer of permission. And, and in most cases, having the parent present before we do anything, any testing or anything with the child. And the nurse is doing this? The nurse is doing it, absolutely. And we've had a couple cases where the nurse is out um, and there's been a sub-nurse in the building the sub nurses have not been trained to provide the testing, so we have worked with the parent to get the next closest site that's convenient for them so that they could go to a different school and get the test completed. How are our nurses handling this workload? It's a lot. I've stopped in and talked to I, one of them. I, and them. I mean, in addition to, you know, the asthmatics and the medication that they give out on a daily basis and the sore throats. So fortunate, fortunately, um, I think one school had five five tests in a day, but for the most part, um, even at the high school, they may have two or three, one to three tests a day. So they're not getting a lot of testing um, right now. Um, and so that's not taking up a lot of their time, but parents contacting them, them contacting parents, even evaluating yeah. right. symptomatic children. I mean, um, it takes a lot of time, and they're they have been really rock stars and troopers um, throughout all this, and it's it's their job, and they're doing it, and you know, um, and they're they're doing it with a kind heart and a pleasant demeanor. So they when are I, amazing. I talked to one. I talked to a few of them today, and one of them I think said had. 67 phone calls in one day, just from parents and just with you know work and right. So I think had we seen the first two weeks continue, we'd be having a different discussion um, because it was scary those first two weeks at, at the number of calls that were having to be made and the time being spent on contact tracing. And you know, again, we, we've all been there to help other schools out when we've been kind of pitching in and looking at schedules and trying to help nurses. But I think if the first two weeks kept repeating themselves, we'd be having a, a much different conversation. Are they able to get their job done during the course of a normal school day, or are they having to stay late to make these phone calls? Um, earlier on, they were having to stay late. Um, they're sort of in that still getting a little bit caught up, um, but it's it's less time now that they're spending um, elementary I think one of the things that they're struggling with is to find a balance because parents can dojo them anytime and then the, and if it's over the weekend or if it's even in the evening if a parent saying my child's symptomatic they want to make sure they're reaching out so they don't send their child the next day um, so you know just trying to work out and find that balance 
I think the only thing that they're worried about is the immunizations and physicals. Um, but we're going to work on that and help them with that as well. And are we taking care of them if they have to stay late, the nurses? I mean, uh, we received extra funding we're prepared to, to move forward. Some, uh, some of our nurses, we've looked at our, all the hours as well. And so we've increased hours for some nurses. Um, and we, we have the funding to be able to cover that. Okay. And so um, just a couple other things that I wanted to um, point out about this. Parents, if parents are interested in signing up their students for the diagnostic testing, there is a school specific link for that and so um, that is on the school's website in the scrolling bar um, it talks about student COVID student testing and there's a link and they can click on that link and still register um, if they're not sure and they aren't sure until they need the service then they can click then they can register at the time that they need the service if they decide to do that um, at this time we have 180 a hundred no let me start again we have 896 students and, st and staff members that have um, opted into the program um, and the program only allows us to do staff and school age children and what about there was something on there some parents were concerned about that I just spoke with about it says on there it's good for five years does that mean that the school or is good or the company will keep it on file for five years so if by chance next year hopefully if you know COVID's kind of a memory I mean do we just is it gonna still stay I mean so the company keeps that the company does keep that information for five years and so um, I think when I've talked to a couple of parents about it it's not they weren't so concerned about what we were going to do with the information but what if, it, what if they were like a military family and they moved somewhere else and you know they did they had different options um, and so parents can opt out they can submit something in writing to color and opt out so it, we just they just need to be told very upfront if you are doing this but then for whatever reason it's up to them to opt out later at a later date if they don't feel comfortable staying in it you mentioned 896, I believe. Do you think that's because they're not aware of it or they're just not taking the time to opt in? Or is there a reason behind the low? I think that it's a little bit of both. Um, I broke down the schools and I was surprised at the number in some of the schools. So I'm gonna to talk to them individually to see if they can do a little bit of marketing um, because I thought it would be higher. Me too. Um, in some specific schools um, I think for example like the high school so the high school had quite a few um, I didn't bring the broken down numbers with me but the high school had quite a few that signed up um, however still um, we are having people that when they're presented with the situation and they have set their child has symptoms or whatever and they want to get tested we've signed several up this week when they needed the service I know that we did one uh, vaccine clinic. Did we have a good response from that? We had 20, about 20 people, and that included students and parents. Do you have a percentage of the number of staff members that have been vaccinated and updated? I, I can give you that. I have a spreadsheet with all that listed, but I did not bring the numbers tonight, but I can give you that information. I know we were. 90% at one time. We were about 82% okay. last year okay. um, with the current staff that we had. Um, I redid the survey this year. Um, you know, and it's option. You know, it's an optional survey, so um, I can give you the numbers of the people that responded. I do know for a fact that there are people who did not respond to the survey but were vaccinated, and they understand that when we look at quarantining. If they don't disclose it, then they they have, they have to report. So we have 4,400 students enrolled. How many um, staff members and, and other employees on that 4,400 with our students do we have? Do you want, I didn't have a number. Or, I didn't break that down. So I just went in by school. 
and looked at the number. I didn't look at number of staff versus students because it's not a separate study so count. I have, I have a couple of questions. We've recently started that deep sanitizing again, right? Like yes. once a week. Yes, we did. So that's a good thing. And mask breaks. Are is there are children just able to take them whenever they need one? Or are we making sure they get mask breaks? I really think about the high school. I mean, if the high school has to sit for an hour and fifteen minutes. I, I would I do not I think the answer would vary based on the grade level. Um, I think that what we found out initially in some of those quarantines were related to kids choosing a mask break for extensive periods of time. But once, I think once we've all got on the same page, um, I think they're using it judiciously at the elementary level, the middle and the high school level. Um, having spent a lot of time recently in the high school, by and large the kids um, are, are wearing their mask, and I do see them they'll take a break in the hallway briefly and put it back up and so on. So or even in the classrooms when they're yeah. spread right. apart, I've seen them do that. And if they, if the teacher elects to go outside and teach a class, which we can now with the nice weather, then they don't have to wear the mask. That is correct. What about PE? Are there any more guidelines, even if they're inside? Because I know that that's tricky situation you know a lot of parents are concerned with their kids you know running around in the gym and having to keep them on um, so it would be up to, to the PE teacher to modify the activities um, because they have to wear the mask this time so if it, the, there's, there's not any wiggle room even if they're doing it far apart what about the nurse that's possibly going to be provided to us through the health department. Mm -hmm. Are we going to get that? So we we got funds from the health department and then we're getting additional funds. Mm -hmm. And so um, we've looked at um, using some of the funds to pay about a nurse and a half currently of what we have. I see. And then we are looking at increasing the hours of nurses that aren't full-time to be able to give them more hours to be able to get the stuff done. So it wouldn't be another nurse coming. So we have discretion over how those funds are used. I see. So we're trying to stretch those dollars as far as we can because nurses are generally locally funded. So we're trying to stretch that out. And that would, that's just a, like a one-year thing, correct? Correct. <laughs> All right, second reading of policies 4400, attendance, and policy 3620, extracurricular activities and student organizations, Dr. Matt Lutz, and assistant superintendent, Ms. Renee Dowdy. Defer to Ms. Dowdy. <laughs> she loves to talk about attendance. <laughs> uh, in our last review of the, or first read of the policies, we really just talked a lot about uh, much of the information remained the same. It just shifted around in the policy. Um, so one of the things we said we liked about the policy was the inclusion of um, information regarding arriving late to school and leaving school early because we've long said that's an issue happening in our school building. So we were excited to see that that was added in there. Um, the only discussion that was had during the first reading was looking at some administrative guidelines as they uh, pertain specifically to makeup work and having some consistency about teaching staff understanding what's <coughs> permissible with makeup work. So um, obviously as part of our strategic plan, you saw one of our goals was to look at norming some of our policies. So we have solicited information from our schools about what their current makeup policies are so that we can begin to work on some administrative guidelines to supplement this policy um, specific to makeup work um, and students who have absences and what's permissible from makeup work. So there's consistency. So a teacher a kid doesn't leave classroom A first period and the teacher says, you don't get to make up any work. And then teacher B says, you have the rest of nine weeks to make up the work. So we're gonna work on those. Um, you know, Dr. Luke has a teacher advisory committee that he works with. We think it's a great opportunity for those teachers to have some input in that as well. And we'll be working on norming that policy uh, and providing some administrative guidelines for um, our staff and families so that everybody knows what's expected. 
So we won't do anything with this policy until that's in place, until that's decided? So we do not have to, Ms. Yvette can correct us if we're wrong. So the administrative guidelines, I don't know if they require a, a vote on the policy. So we can go ahead and adopt the second read of the policy. Those administrative guidelines then just get included. So it's that regulation code you see a lot of times, board policy will have the board policy code and then the R for the regulations. And so it's not actually something that formally has to be adopted for those extra administrative guidelines to go in place. I find it ironic that under late arrivals and early departures, which is Part B, if there's any disciplinary consequence for unexcused tardiness or unexcused early departures, and then you skip down to the bottom, and it says consequences may not exceed a short-term suspension of two days. What a punishment. You know, they're getting punished for missing school by missing more school. And I know that doesn't pertain to us, but I know that they're, it's ludicrous to believe they're or school districts if we punish kids for missing school by missing more school. Just an observation. <laughs> this, this is just a recommendation from the school board association. We can mark out any language, correct? Mm -hmm. So we don't have to have that, Dr. Dominic. We don't want them to miss more school. Oh, it's, no, but it's, it's in, we won't either. It's yeah. it's in there because some there it's to protect the students against. Uh, Miss uh, administration of the punishment, like Dr. Tommy says. So it's there. We can strike that language, but we're never going to this community. That makes no sense. Why would we suspend students? We want them in school. We are in school. And it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. The, the sentence before it says the superintendent of designee shall list in the code of student conduct the specific range of consequences that should be imposed. So that gives them the right with, uh, I guess, the approval of the board. Did not have to suspend it. Section A mentions and or like it's an option to check in either online or offline and or have a daily check in. Mm -hmm. Are we not requiring a daily so that, check in? So you got to think about no, well, check in means I did my work and submitted it. Technically, yeah. Google Classroom records that. So that's a check in. It notes that on this date at this time I submitted my assignment. So that counts as that check in. But for a kid that may not have internet, it may be the parent that calls up and says, you know, hey, just letting you know he's not feeling well. We won't probably be able to do our work today. We're going to try again tomorrow. As far as it goes about makeup work, I, I myself would really like to hold off on doing anything with this, or I'd like to revisit it when you've come up with the plan for makeup work. Yeah, I don't, again, makeup work's not in the policy other than it says it's you know, the teacher's discretion. Yeah, so that part. We will create those administrative guidelines. I don't want to delay having the policy in place if we can help it only because I don't think it's going to change that part of it. We can certainly work on the administrative guidelines and then to provide clarity and for then all of put our staff. Them with and embed them in there. Because yeah. you've got to realize most of our staff have already submitted syllabuses. They've already sent out to everybody what their expectations are. So it's going to take some communication on the backside to 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 do all of that and let them know that there are changes to that policy or, or their syllabus for the rest of the semester or whatever the case may be. Whenever we adopt those guidelines. And when do you plan to have that information? as possible I, we don't have we don't have a set meeting date to say hey we're going to convene a group of teachers like i said i already all principals got emails from us to draft their current policies so we can see where everybody was so that we can then start looking at how do we modify and adjust those so the first step's been done now it's just a matter of getting everybody together to craft what that looks like so the attendance policy we believe is a much stronger and better policy. this policy is superior to what we've been operating on we like the language, but we do need to tighten up the, the makeup work policy, which we think that's important to get our feedback from, from staff and from our principals. Uh, but we wanted to start with the school board's association because they can provide us the support that they have done. Um, so we'll, we'll move forward with that as quickly as we can. Um, so I think we had the best intentions to bring that uh, forward to this meeting. Um, Unfortunately, the start of the school year did not begin the way that we thought it was. Busy, busy. I do think it needs to be, you know, I don't I don't know if it should be left up to each individual teacher. I think students should I'm start in agreement with you. And in most of our buildings it's not. Buildings have policies in their buildings. 
Um, but we want it to be throughout the county. So sure. We and, and, and with any rule, policy, guideline, it's only as good as the enforcement of yeah. it from the exactly. person that's supposed to do that. So um, all of our buildings have policies regarding late work. So within those buildings, it's consistent, um, which is really most important at that point in time because kid A and kid B should be treated the same in that building. Um, Absolutely. So yeah. I, you know, I feel whether it's a minimum of there. three days that's or right. whatever. And, and that was great. She's already pulled samples. You know, the board provides some sample guidelines, administrative guidelines that have already been out there. She's already pulled a couple of them for us to just look at and see how close they are, what's already in place in some of our buildings. So up to this point, it really was up to each principal to form or to work with their staff about makeup work. So, okay. And it's different. I mean, I think it's different at grade spans. Well, right. I'm sure elementary is different from mm -hmm. high school and expectations, but... Um, so that's our goal, is to look at it by grade spans as we look at either K5, 6, 12, or K5, 6, 8, 9, 12. That's, that's our thought process. And, and on the other hand, it, you know, for the teachers, you can't just give the kids six weeks to get the work in because they need to get the work rated and taken care of, too. So, I think... Tighten, you know, if we can tighten that up some, it'll be to everybody's benefit. Okay. Any other questions? End of grade and end of course testing data update from Dr. Luce and Ms. Sandy Reynolds. I know everybody's excited about testing day. <laughs> yeah, it gets everybody going. So it is that time of year. Um, last year was a blur for everybody. We did, it was the only year in 25 years of teaching that we did not have any standardized testing at the end of the year, so it was uh, new for everybody. But we did um, this past year, and so I'm gonna share that data with you today. Um, we're gonna go through this, and then if you have questions at the end, I'll, I'll answer any that I can. So just to kind of put everything in perspective before you look at these graphs, we started last school year, remote for all, and I put pre-K just so there was clarity and understanding, pre-K through 12 students. Uh, we did ask our staff members to come back in to the buildings, which was not done in other districts, but that was our decision to do. Uh, elementary students were then brought back into schools in October. And at that time, because it was a state requirement, we did start the K-5 uh, virtual academy. Middle school students were then brought back in in a hybrid model in November, with the group remaining virtual, and high school came back in January with the group remaining virtual. We found out after that um, EOG and EOC testing would be required and would be required to be administered in person. That was probably around February we found out about that. Um, and then it was kind of dragging on as to whether or not they were going to waive any of the SS standards and we eventually were notified that the SS standards that would be waived is just the 95% participation. So they weren't going to hold us to that as part of our um, requirements. So our LEA data for our elementary schools across the district, blue is Curry Tech County and red is the state. Although we all certainly want all of our proficiency rates to be higher, we can all agree we all want them to be higher, at least if in every area we were above the state proficiency rate for this past year. In all areas, third grade reading through fifth grade science. For middle school, you can see that we were higher than the state in all areas except seventh grade reading, eighth grade reading, um, and eighth grade math. Uh, the reason um, there's no math one on here, we did still administer math, we did still have math one in the middle schools and we did still administer that testing, is because it was not listed on the internal results review data that we received back. Um, but a hand calculation was that 87% uh, were proficient um, out of the 53 students who took math one and were tested. And the state uh, proficiency was um, 76 because we found that on a separate document. And then high school proficiency, they were above the state in all areas. 
to break it down by elementary school. Central Elementary was above the state in all areas except fourth grade math and fifth grade reading. Just to include the percent uh, participation uh, rate, in case you were interested, they were had over 90% of their kids come back in the building to test. Griggs, they were above the state uh, proficiency in third grade reading, third grade math, and fourth grade reading, and they had over 95% come back in to test. Jarvisburg, they were above in all areas except third grade reading, fourth grade reading, and fourth grade math. They were above 95% participation in all grade levels except third grade. Not silent, they were above the state in all areas except fourth grade math, fifth grade reading, and fifth grade math, and they had over 95% of their kids come back in to test. Moyak Elementary was above the state rate in all areas except fifth grade reading, and they had over 95% come back in to test. Shalborough was above the state rate in all areas. They had over 95% participation, except for fourth grade reading, they had 93% of their kids come in, and fourth grade math, they had 92% of their kids come back in. For our middle schools, Tech uh, Middle was equal or above the state rate in sixth grade reading and sixth grade math. Their math one calculation on this graph, um, I need to say, is hand calculated, so it is not off of a state report. Um, so understand that there are no business rules applied to that data, but we wanted to include it here. Explain that again, if you would, about the eighth grade math. And they're hand calculated, so they're, they're it's not the state's so what happens is when we test we upload all of our data to the state they take that data and then they apply business rules to that data that's part of our ESSA testing plan so to give you um, a, probably a, the easiest one to understand an English language learner who joins our school will be tested on the first year that they join but they are not counted in our growth they are not counted in our they are not counted in proficiency or growth but they do count in participation. They are required to test, that's their baseline. The second year that they are in our schools, they count in participation and growth, but not proficiency. The third year they are in our schools, they count in participation, growth, and proficiency. So it affects the overall score. So if we just did all of our, like if Greta just figured out all of her percentages from just her data um, rosters, it would not necessarily exactly match up with what we get when we get the internal results reviews because the state has applied those business rules. I just gave you one example like English language learners. There's partial enrollment rules. That are, there's actually a whole list of um, rules that they apply, which, you know, those of us who have, have taught for years, you got a kid a month before school ended they're like how is it fair that 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 test is being you know how is it fair that that my, I'm being you know measured against that child I didn't have them all year long so they have all of these rules in place that they apply to our data to try and give a, a more accurate picture of the results based on our instruction and our interaction and what's fair to the students. And it's still a terrible school no matter how you look at it right well, 76, 76 for the percent for the state under the circumstances, um, you know, we were at 69. And you have to take into consideration that these students were out until November. Yeah, but we're looking at the state. I mean, we're comparing ourselves to the state, so they were out too. We definitely have room for improvement, and, and everybody in here would, would agree to that. And Christy Hodges is going to speak more to uh, when she starts her presentation about what our plans are to um, address our results. We, we do have somebody in place for that, correct? For math, don't we? Did, are you talking about instructional like math? Coaches? Yes. Yes, and she will, she will be able to speak to the number of instructional coaches that were added. Okay. Um, you know, we are grateful that the county commissioners applied, uh, you know, gave good. us that additional funding so that we could provide that extra level of support. Good. So for my middle school, uh, they were equal or above the state in all areas except eighth grade math. They had over 95% participation, except for sixth grade math, they had 94% come in to test. Again, the same thing with their math one scores. That, that was the only score that was hand calculated. 
on our high schools for Prairie Tech County High School equal or above the state rate in all areas except math three participation varied so our math one uh, participation 88 percent of the kids came in math three was 93 percent came in English two was eight at uh, 93 percent in biology we had 90 percent who um, came in to test At JP NAP, they were above the state in all areas and had over 90% participation. I mean, 95%, excuse me. Um, the question continues to come up about uh, potential learning loss. We've heard about it since March 2020. You know, what does that mean? If you Google it, you're going to see hundreds of thousands of responses about learning loss. It started as soon as, as people, you know, were we're moving to um, remote instruction. We are going to share all of these results that you're getting ready to see are a hand calculations because every student that was in Virtual Academy for K-5 was still tagged to their home school. So their results were com calculated in with their school results. This is just for you to be able to see a picture of um, the students that we had in virtual. So as you can see, we were above the state rate. Again, no business rules were applied, except for fourth grade reading, fourth grade math, fifth grade math, and fifth grade science. We had um, over 84% of our virtual academy kids who came back in their buildings to take their test. Students were still assigned to their school zones and scores were calculated again with the previous slides. Um, there's no chart for middle and high school virtual because they were in a hybrid model. There was no clear data distinction because we had some students, uh, they all kept the same teacher for the semester of the year and there was movement back and forth between in-person and virtual. So there was really no definitive, yes, we can say these kids remained virtual 100% of the time and these kids were back to in-person, so it, we can't tease that out. And then the other question is, okay, we've seen what we have. How much learning loss do we think we had compared to? So last year, we didn't have anything to compare it to. Um, you know, Denise's school and Dr. Durham's school did have fall testing because that happened before March 2020, but that is such a, a small data set that we went back two years. So we're looking at data from 1819 versus 2021. So our elementary schools, the blue bar is 18-19 data and the red bar is 2021 data. And you can see across the board that we dropped in all areas. So even though our data from this year is higher than the state, which makes, you know, we're, we feel slightly better, we were higher from the state and what, what was going on, we have dropped in every single area. So that is what we're dealing with and that is what we're concerned about trying to, to do what we need to do best for our kids to, um, to make up for that learning loss and, and get us all moving forward. For middle school, again, we dropped in every area. Now for Math 1, it's not on here, but for Math 1, Curry Tech County, um, students had I think this was that the 1819 um, state score was a 93% and ours was um, a 96%. I think that was the 1819. My notes are a little muddled, but I can get that information for you more clearly about the 1819 versus the, the, um, the 2021 you saw on the previous slide. I think the 96% the was um, the 1819 comparison. And then high school proficiency. Again, blue is 1819 and red is 2021. We actually increased in English 2 and ACT. And the other three areas dropped. Bottom line, we need our kids in school. So moving forward, this is what we have. This is what we are. Um, definitely concerned about and want to do something about as much as possible and that's what we've all been working towards. Um, Christy Hodges has worked 
um, tirelessly with the team to come up with the critique, uh, curriculum strategic plan, which she's going to share with you. Um, but I also wanted to, to just um, highlight the fact that we're also providing not only the plan, the vetted resources, which include devices, subscriptions, print resources as well. Um, we are providing training, which the PLC meetings, we are hoping to again receive the DLI grant funds as soon as the state decides a budget. And so we will have another digital teacher leader cohort. And we're also utilizing some of our ESSER funds to provide West and Key Strength training for our administrative team and our instructional coaches. All of that is based on John Hattie's uh, instructional practices that have a high effect size, research-based high effect size, and how does those look when they're being implemented with Fidelity. Um, and then support, again, just a plug-in for the commissioners. We're grateful for the financial support for the additional instructional coaches so that our teachers can have the uh, additional support that, that we all need. And Christy is going to share some more specifics about you know where we want to be and, and how we're going to start the plans to get there. Do you guys have any other questions for me? Oh, it seems like science and all of most of these charts is usually is usually consistently higher. Is, is that the norm? Is, is science usually a better? Is that I'm a little partial because I was <laughs> the science. Teacher. I mean, it, I'm just wondering. It, is it just it just the science just seems to kids it comes easier to kids or they they test well? So well, Lenetti's back there too, and we're making eye contact. So okay, as a science as a former science <laughs> teacher, I taught all subjects, but I I did teach fifth grade science, and there are certain things that are um, key to being successful on that test. Um, and I don't want it to sound like I'm saying teaching to the test because that that is not it. And I always told my kids we're doing the standards. As long as we do what we need to do going through, then the test is going to take care of itself. But we worked heavy on vocabulary. Because if you can't understand what you're reading, because that ties back to ELA comprehension, if you can't understand what this question is asking you, and they're all application questions, then there's no way you're taking a 25% chance that you're going to make the right, the right guess. So we worked heavy and all year long on that vocabulary, content-specific vocabulary, until <coughs> they were very comfortable with it. And then we would play um, games, engaging things where they would uh, practice those <coughs> test questions uh, out of SchoolNet because there's a great library of SchoolNet test questions and you could unpack those um, questions and say, well, what are, it's a very wordy, what are they actually getting to? So just working them through that process so that by the time they're actually sitting in front of that test, they're much more comfortable with it. Um, and so I think that's part of but it's know, application, those, like you said. All it's, application. It's not just that you memorize or that mm -hmm. you know how to do it's application. You have to know what the water cycle is to be able to answer the question that is related to which step comes before or after, you know, condensation. They, they have to be able, and then they apply those to different things. So the kids also are taught, well, at least in my class, and Lynette can speak um, more to the eighth grade, is you'll see the same concept just worded differently over and over and over again and are you recognizing that it's basically asking you the same thing in a different way and applying it to a different situation and um, I think that that helps them and then the hands-on labs that we do helps them become more comfortable when they get to that but it's it's there's a lot of verbiage in it um, and I think just prepping the kids and, and Lynette's situation may be slightly different but that was my experience in fifth grade science so the test is totally correlated with the standards of the grade level and so if you teach what you're supposed to teach and you engage your kids, you're going to do well in that science test. It doesn't seem to have a correlation with your reading or your math. It all has to do with if you taught what you were supposed to teach and we have had that, that curricular randomness throughout our district. A fifth grade a science teacher at Jarvisburg should be teaching the same fifth grade science and not sign. We should see a performance across the board on that science test. And so when we see the randomness of where it's at, because if you compare like groups of children to like groups, we should have a much more consistent performance. But not only in science. I'm speaking specifically for science. It's it all be, of our grade levels. That, that's should not be. our biggest problem with, with this. It's not that we science teacher that is teaching and the, the student is able to retain that information and do well on the test, then you say, wow, that teacher must really know her stuff. 
So what I would think, you want to mirror that teacher and say, if that's working for you, I want to see our other teachers doing the same thing that you're doing, if it's working. So you can do that and apply it to any teacher, whatever subject it is. And that's where I get a little bit confused because I don't think we're utilizing some of our best teachers that are able to communicate and teach the children where they comprehend what they're learning. Therefore, it shows the positive scores at the end of, of grade testing. So that's what I have, I have, I have heartburn about. Well, and that's where when Christy presents her, our mm -hmm. curricular strategic plan, it is designed to address exactly what you're speaking okay. to. Because it is not okay that we are not exposing all of our kids to high quality resources, right. high quality lesson plans. It is not okay that one kid should be, we should be sitting in one di one building at 35% and another building at 80. Right. It, it's, it, we, and this group said beyond you, they know when we meet as an admin group, our meetings are based on our strategic plan and our curriculum plan. So we're not guessing what we're going to do each meeting. We're not making it up as we go. And so that also is very concerning. And, and part of that, that we, it was, it's, a, it's upon us and, and our curriculum coaches and this team in here to make sure that we have set our teachers up for success and our principals up for success as well. And so we have provided those resources that we haven't necessarily provided in the past. And we have, we're going to stay tight to our pace and guys, and again, I don't want to steal too much of Christie's thunder, but I think she's going to answer uh, some of those questions that was vetted through. And, and I, I know that when we first showed some of this work with our principals back in February, they were, they were just jumping out of their seats going, oh my goodness, this is great because this is what we need. Um, and then we do need to utilize our top teachers to, to do that. To, to share that work as well, but it's incumbent upon all of us in this room to make sure that all of our kids get access to that by ensuring that our teachers do that. Right. And, it, and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say it again tonight, it, it's 80% of your time needs to be spent on hardcore on your standards work. You have 20, you have discretion. It is not teach to the test. It is not, and Sandy said, you do not teach to a test. You teach for understanding, you teach for learning. And so there's always discretion, but, it, but we've got way too much discretion on what it is that we're teaching. I think so. That should not be a right. discussion. This yeah. is what we teach in fourth grade. Exactly. So this is about kids that get exposed, learn. Mm -hmm. And so we have to do that. And it is our charge as educators to do that. Well, we do have to say that, that it's only been recent that we have funded um, instructional coordinators. Again, yep. you know, we had them at one point. <coughs> We didn't have them. Now we've got them. Thank you, commissioners, for the extra money. And so now maybe our teachers will have the resources that they need. Yes. Yeah. So. We did not provide, and not, not just current, we, we as a state, we as a nation have not provided our teachers. When we no. switched over to the common, no. to the common standards, Absolutely not. we did not back support. Right. So no. for Everly Lynette, Lynette Gordon, who took her eighth grade science standards and took them to a whole nother level, where others say, well, I think this is what it is. Right. I, I'm going to give my best shot, and here's this and here's that. So and you're, you're, you're correct, Janet. I mean, so it, it is, and we are part of this plan is to make sure that we're providing those resources and then expecting that they're used. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, they're, getting, they're understanding the science from their reading. <laughs> so they're doing great. So they have that base, so. Yeah, it was just intriguing to me to see their science numbers always seem to be the higher. Well, and we do have, even when we did not have instructional coaches for many years, we still had, like Angela Ferris, when she was still in the classroom, she was reaching out to me about my science materials and I was no longer, I was in the AID position. So there are teachers who have been sharing their knowledge. We even did a session with fifth grade um, teachers. I was still in this position and I did a session. So. That we, we are working on it, definitely. All right, curriculum strategic plan presentation by Christy Hodges. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I am super excited to see 
stand up here to talk to you about the curriculum strategic plan. I believe in it. It's been a collaborative effort by a lot of people that are sitting here in this room. Um, I, I appreciate Sandy's slide uh, to transition us. I want to speak to you very quickly about the term learning loss. State used that a lot during COVID. They have switched the language to learning recovery and acceleration. And so it is my hope that the curricular strategic plan does just that, that we can recover and accelerate our learning. Before I get into some of the nuts and bolts of this, I want to give you a friendly reminder. This is year one of a three to five year plan. So you're probably going to see areas of growth that we need to, to address. And we hope, do have plans to address them in years two, three, four, and five maybe even beyond that. This was, um, uh, the focus again was, what are we gonna do in this first year? So I wanna start you off uh, with a timeline. I, I will not read every part of it, I'll give you just a general overview. In looking at this timeline, the process began over nine months ago with a conversation that happened in December of 2020. Uh, in, the, in the spring, this work took on some of the role of the district strategic plan. We, we uh, tapped into Mitch Owen's work and crafted some of the curricular strategic plan work around his work. You can see also in the spring is when we held listening sessions where we brought in elementary, middle, and high school teachers to hear and get curriculum feedback from them. We also interviewed teachers in specialty areas. We had uh, interviewed all uh, administrators at the time, and we collected over 1,800, I'm gonna say sticky notes. Sandy would probably rather me say data points. <laughs> but it was a lot of work, but what was great is our curricular strategic plan is really a response to the feedback that we got. Um, there were no surprises to the curricular strategic plan. It just reiterated some of the areas where we knew we needed to pay attention. One of the really exciting things that I can stand here and tell you about is in our response during the listening sessions, we had a lot of teachers say, I'm okay with professional development, but I want some choice. And that was how we framed our convocation in August around choice. And we held 75 breakout sessions so that teachers could have choice. That's just one example of how we are responding to their feedback and letting them know that we did listen to them. As part of this work, the team created a curricular belief statement. I'm not sure if any of you have ever been part of that process, but you talk about words matter. <laughs> Every word in this uh, curricular belief statement was talked about, even words such as and and the. And so um, I want to read this to you, and then I'd like to unpack it a little bit for you, okay? Currituck County Schools believes all students deserve equitable access to rigorous instruction, standards aligned curriculum and high quality learning resources and that's really what we believe and that's where every bit of our work is heading toward so let me unpack so rigorous rigorous instruction like Sandy talked about when you look up learning laws you can look up the word rigorous and see a lot of different references on what that is in simplest forms it's it's really when you take when lessons encourage thinking deeply that you're not looking at just memorization and recall. Um, standard aligned curriculum. So Ms. Etheridge, you brought up a really good point. One thing that all good teachers have in common is attention to standards work. I can, I'm very proud to say that we spent uh, the last six months creating pacing guides. And pacing guides, what they do is they ensure that if you follow the pacing guide, that the district puts in front of you, you will have taught every standard within the North Carolina standard course of study. What's also really powerful about pacing guides is this. What's happening at Charboro should be happening at Moyot, that should be happening at Jarvisburg, that should be happening at Griggs. And so pacing guides are really critical to this work. My instructional coaches, I call them mine because they are part of uh, who I am. 
our instructional coaches. They led this work. Um, uh, I, was, I got to be part of this work as well. We brought in K-8 teachers and we created pacing guides for the four content areas, science, social studies, ELA, and math. We also, in year one, looked at the high school and had to decide <laughs> where do we start. And, and the most logical place to start was in our EOC areas. Year two, we're going to expand that, and we hope to even get into the elective classes. So in our EOCs, we now have pacing guides for English 2, Biology, Math 1, and Math 3 at the high school level. Again, our instructional coaches were instrumental in that work. And then when we look at high-quality learning resources, um, we really wanted to take a, a good look at what resources are coming into our schools and are they of high quality and so we spent a lot of time as a curricular strategic planning team vetting those resources meaning looking at its purpose is there research behind these resources and we came up with terms such as expected use of resources as well as optional use of resources and i'll speak to that in just a minute we also go with that are also not saying to teachers you cannot bring in something that you like but what we are doing is we created a vetting process so if a teacher comes to miss kelly at moyak and says i found this really great resource can i talk to you about it miss kelly's going to have a conversation and through the questioning from miss kelly she's going to then say hmm, this might be worth looking into and she's going to fill out a google form that's part of the vetting process Instructional coaches will then look further into that resource and we'll let Ms. Kelly know, yes, this is something we can support as a district, or no, it is not something. So we are still allowing some teacher choice. So a mission statement really focuses on the how. How do you respond to what you say you're going to do in your belief statement, okay? So this reads, Currituck County Schools will ensure our instructional staff is provided with clear curriculum expectations. Again, that goes back to you, uh, Ms. Etheridge, and your, com com uh, your comment. Training, vetted resources, and continued support to grow our students into the best versions of themselves. Version of themselves. Again, really excited about the language in here. It was intentional and um, not generic mm -hmm. in nature. And so we're really excited. I'd like to unpack this, and when I unpack it, I'm going to combine some of the terms. I'm going to combine curriculum expectations and vetted resources. And what you're going to see here are what teachers receive, and you have also in your packet. So we're first going to take a look at kindergarten through fifth grade. So curricular parameters. Parameter is a structure. Okay. So these are really, when we say we are going to have clear curriculum expectations, these parameters are just that. They are clear expectations. So in grades kindergarten through fifth, and this structure is exactly the same in our other grade spans, in 6, 8, and 9, 12. This is what our teachers are, going, are asked to do this year. These are non-negotiables. If you notice at the top of every one, it starts with the district pacing guide. Again, I want to emphasize that all good teachers have in common, what they all have in common is that they follow standards. There's other things they have in common, but that's the common denominator, is that they all follow the standards. So um, you can see in some of the areas we have more specific things, and you can see that we have areas of growth in the area of so social studies, and that's something we'll look at in year two. This was a heavy lift for year one. I'm proud of the work, again, that our team did to get to where we are. If you look at the second page, and again, you're gonna see the same type of um, layout for the 6-8. You're gonna see the vetted curriculum resources. And again, we have the term expected and optional. On here, you're going to see both print and digital resources. So if you look at the expected use, we are expecting our teachers to use these resources because they support the curricular parameters. So for example, Studies Weekly, it is a digital and it is a print resource. 
this resource was used to create our pacing guides in K5. So that is expected to be used. When we get to optional use, we purchased these resources as well, but we are allowing school levels and teachers to make the decision of whether or not these resources um, are gonna be used in their classroom. Next, if we look at 6-8, you'll see again the same format. You'll also see that we have our work cut out for us at that, this middle school level for year two. Um, we have, um, again, you notice the common thread of pacing guides. So again, that was our number one commitment to ensure that standards were covered in this most important year of learning recovery and learning acceleration. And if you go down to the second page, you see the same language of expected use and optional use. Again, we have our work cut out and we are gonna be looking at additional resources for this grade span uh, in year two. When we get to 9-12, that's where you're going to see where our greatest work needs to occur. And we know that. But this was a great start for us for year one. We have two things added in each um, EOC area. We have the district pacing guides as well as unit assessments. So we created unit assessments and what that does is that makes sure that all of our, our teachers that are teaching math one are given the same unit assessment we can take a look at that data and offer support if it is needed science we were blessed and we got an nc check-in in biology too our biology that we weren't expecting so that's um that was a bonus and again you'll see the vetted resources expected use and the optional use again we need some work there, and we're, we're well aware of it, and we certainly um, respond to that. So if we go back to the mission statement, the two other words I want to unpack here are training and continued support. When we held our listening sessions, we got a lot of sticky notes slash data points that said you all have historically done a really good job in the past when we've gotten a new resource or something new and it was the initial rollout you've done a great job where you fail is ongoing and continued support this is going to be um, the most exciting part I think because we've got instructional coaches now that are going to provide the training and are going to provide the continued support we also have literacy specialists who are right now in our buildings that are helping with the phonics, the phonics work. And so the continued support will be the layered support that our instructional coaches are going to be able to provide with the weekly PLCs. Uh, Sandy mentioned John Hattie's instructional strategies. That's what the PLCs will look like. They will center around those instructional strategies that have already been researched and vetted for us. And so, um, again, we're real excited and appreciative that the commissioners provided that resource for us. They are uh, invaluable to this work and are going to be a key player in the success of, of, of this work. Um, so I end by, again, saying I'm very proud of this work. It was a collective effort on the part of many. It's nice to have a clear vision and, and one that is a common vision across the district. And um, I thank you for the opportunity to share this with you tonight. Christy. Yes, Dr. Uh, how are you not only going to ensure that the pacing guards are implemented, but also used? That's a great question. Um, it's going to be a collaborative team effort, and it is from top down. So I'm going to start here. It begins with our teachers. It really does. They have to know that these pay and and. And let me also say, the pacing guides are created by their colleagues. They're the people that are in the trenches that know exactly how long it probably takes to teach this particular standard. So it begins with our teachers. We have to trust, right, that they're going to teach this. And then you move up into, I'm going to go to the next layer of our instructional coaches. Okay? Our instructional coaches, um, are, they're the eyes in the building. They're going to be the ones that communicate to 
uh, me maybe, or they're going to communicate to each other, and they're going to hopefully um, provide that support in the classroom and say, hey, talk to me about where you are in your pacing guide. And so hopefully it, it will, will um, maybe stop there, but if it doesn't, then I'm counting on our administration. We talked extensively as a curricular support team that this work was as good as our principals allow it to be in their buildings. Yeah. Because guess what? They are instructional leaders. They're not just principals. I see them as instructional leaders first. And so we need their support. And then it kind of comes up to me. It comes up to Dr. Lutz and Ms. Dowdy. And, and, and so it's layered. But it is a collaborative effort. Yeah, that's what's so hard. I mean, even with my career, 35 years, things have changed so much in 35 years. I fought them tooth and nail because I'm like, I'm doing this. I know how to do it. You don't need to tell me what to change or what to do, especially technology. Sure. So, you know, kicking and screaming. But then after you get over that, it's the best thing that could have ever happened. So I think we have a lot of our, our teachers that have been doing it for this way for so long, it's hard for them to change course, course now. Um, so that's, that's great to hear that, that we'll be checking on, on that and making sure if they need any help, the help is there for them. I, I love this, love That's everything about it. Great. I think it's, it's going to put us right back on the path that we need to be on. So I can't thank you enough uh, for being at the helm. Um, as you know, I admire everything that you do within the Curtis County School System, and, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. We, we recognize that sometimes change is hard. Yes. <laughs> um, but with that training and continued support, we're hoping to make it a little less painful. Mm -hmm. It, well, it all looks, looks wonderful, and the pacing guides are going to be a big deal, mm -hmm. along with the, the instructional coordinators. Mm -hmm. Having somebody to help. Absolutely. You yeah. know, and I, I think we'll be successful, and thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. all of it. Um, the one thing I would ask, the optional use pieces, mm -hmm. um, are we going to keep up with how much they're used since we paid money for those. Oh, absolutely. Okay, because, you know, if, if you vetted them, they look great, you know, that kind of thing. And some of them I recognize that we've been using for a while. But I, I want us to, you know, keep a tight watch on that so that if it's something that we don't need, then, you know, or it's not being used. Absolutely. There are, uh, in some of these digital resources, there are dashboards that allow us to go in and look at usage. Mm -hmm. We also, as a district um, curriculum team, provided guiding questions for our principals that when they go into a classroom, it's not for them to ask questions of their teachers, it's to ask questions of themselves when they go in to say, hmm, this is the language I should see, and this is what this resource looks like. Um, so we are definitely going to track that because we certainly want to honor the um, monies that we have provided in this, yeah. in this okay. support. Thank you. Good job. Well, welcome. Welcome. all this you are our national board certified teacher person too aren't you I am. <laughs> thank you miss hodges all right any other questions or topics or anything that we need to discuss at this point all right if there's not anything else um i would okay. like to yes um, you all aren't always there at the board meetings but i just want you to know that we are so appreciative of all you have done to, to get this year off. We know <laughs> that it has been, I mean, absolutely unbelievable with the buses and everything that's going on. So we just appreciate it so much. Yes. I just want you all to know that. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Every day. And there are many principals who do many different things, whether they're cleaning or or just wear many different hats. Yes. Thank you. And all the maintenance people and school nutrition and our nurse HR and everybody. Thank you. All right. That being said, I would like to close the work session.